Honorable Dr. Peter Kachavivi, Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Deputy Minister of uh, International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Deputy, uh, Honorable Janelle Matundu, the Chairperson of the Erongo Regional Council, Honorable Benita Imbamba, the Acting Chief Regional Officer of the Erongo Regional Council, all CEOs, of course, I see we have representatives from uh, local authorities, all the mayors and members of the management committee, as well as uh, the CEOs, captains of industry, representatives of political parties, traditional and faith-based organizations, esteemed panelists, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, and all protocol observed. Today is a very big day in the calendar of the Erongo region because we are honored that this 19th public lecture 19th Dr. Tio Ben Kurira public lecture is taking place in the Erongo region from where Honorable Dr. Tio Ben Kurira hails. And he would always say, when we meet, I'm from Erongo. And then I'm from Usakos. But most importantly, I'm from Uikrens. <laughs> My name is Michael Jimmy. I'm the personal assistant to the governor of the Erongo region. And I welcome you all to this 19th. Dr. Tio Ben Kurira Lecture Series, coming to you live from Swakopmund in the Erongo region. A special welcome is extended to those following this lecture series on our different virtual platforms, the Mirko Facebook page, NBC live streaming, and other social platforms through which this is being broadcast. Since the launch of the Tio ben, Dr. Tio Ben Kurira Lecture Series, on the 31st, by His Excellency Dr. Hake G. Tanko, President of the Republic of Namibia, the, the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation has hosted 18 successful lecture sessions aimed at evolve, involving the public in taking an interest in and shaping the policy on international relations and cooperation of the Republic of Namibia. Today, the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation brings to you the 19th Tio ben, Dr. Tio Ben Kurira Lecture Series under the theme, How Can African Continental Free Trade Agreement Benefit Erongo Region to be the preferred gateway to Africa and the world at large. It is my privilege now to introduce the panelists joining me this morning to tackle this great topic at hand. On my immediate left, I'm joined by Mr. Chino Anabeb. Anabeb from uh, the, the Ch Chief Executive Officer of Erongo Red. And next to him, is uh, Mr. Andrew Kanime, the Chief Executive Officer of the Namibian Ports Authority, NAMPOT, followed by uh, the Deputy Minister, Honorable General Matundu. And then we have uh, 
Dr. John Stadler, an old friend, and my brother whom I shared friendship with way back in the 80s as student and youth activist. And then we have uh, Mr. Gilbert Boyce from the Wolfish Bay uh, Corridor Group. Our audience Our audience, as well as uh, members of the public, are tuned live through the NBC, as I stated, Mirko fan Facebook page. And please feel welcome to participate in the comment session. I would now like to, before we start, allow me to acknowledge it's also a very special day for His Excellency, uh, President of the Republic of Namibia, Dr. Hage Kainko. It is his birthday today. So we say happy birthday to His Excellency from the Erongo region. Thank you very much. I'm now honored to welcome Honorable General Matundu, the Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, to deliver the opening remarks. Honorable. We may be seated. <laughs> Honorable Peter Kachavivi, Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Director of Proceedings, allow me to stand on the protocols as established, because I don't want to leave uh, anybody out. A very good morning to you all. Very good morning to you all. I can see Swakop is not called as Venduk. At least here we are breathing. Uh, Director of Ceremony, allow me to tender the apology of my minister, Honorable Dr. Netumbo Nandindaitwa who could not join us this morning. Uh, she is the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. She could not be here in this beautiful town or in a region of excellence uh, due to other equal commitments. Um, this morning, I am honored and privileged to deliver this opening remarks at the 19th Theo Ben Gurira lecture series. Director of Ceremony, allow me time also to acknowledge the presence of our panelists. And for the interest of time, I do not want to repeat their names because they were just recently introduced and I th we know them, they are our own from this very great region or excellence. As I was uh, being informed in the morning that great is Kunene and not Erongo. Erongo is a region of excellence. Uh, the 19th lecture series organized by the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation under the theme, how can the African Continental Free Trade Agreement benefit the Erongo region to be the preferred gateway to Africa and the world at large. This theme will focus on the significant possibilities presented by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement for the Erongo region. The lecture will explore the transformative impact the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can have on this region, positioning it as a preferred gateway to Africa and the rest of the world. The groundbreaking of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which became operational on the 30th of May 2019, is the most extensive free trade agreement globally 
uniting the 54 African Union countries, including Namibia and eight regional economic communities, which is are now the RECs, trading under this African Continental Free Trade Area officially commenced in January 2021. The objective of the Free Trade Agreement is to establish a unified market and a collective GDP for the entire continent, eradicate trade obstacles, and stimulate intra-African trade. It also aims to promote value-added production and trade across all service sectors in the African economy. Though the removal of trade barriers, tariff reductions, and the elimination of non-tariff barriers, the African Continental Free Trade Area fosters enhanced trade among African countries creating a more accessible path for Namibian products and services to enter new markets. A director of ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, regarding the implementation of the agreement, member states are required to create a national and implementation plan for the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area and this strategy serves as a comprehensive framework designed by each African Union member state to efficiently execute and take advantage of the opportunities offered by the African Continental Free Trade Area. Each member state must develop its unique national plan, aligning it with the broader objective of principles of the African Continental Free Trade Area while also addressing the specific requirements and priorities of the uh, domestic economy. To this end, the Namibian government, in collaboration with the Economic Commission for Africa and the United Nations system in Namibia, officially launched Namibia's national strategy and implementation plan for the agreement, establishing the African Continental Free Trade Area for the period of the year 2022 to 2027 in November last year. Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, for Namibia, for Namibia, the African Continental Free Trade Area presents a plethora of advantages that can transform our economic landscape. By signing the African Continental Free Trade Area, Namibia has unlocked access to a market of 1.3 billion people. This means that our businesses, both large and small, can expand their reach beyond our borders, tapping into a larger consumer base and creating new avenues for growth. This is an added advantage to the Irongo region as it holds a pivotal position within the African continent. With access to major ports and transportation networks serving as a natural conduit between the landlocked countries of Southern Africa and the global markets. The African Continental Free Trade Area will amplify this strategic advantage, attracting businesses and investors seeking to tap into the vast African market. I have come to learn that the advancement of the corridor in the, in the last 19 years has positioned Namibia as one of the select countries catering to a vast region of approximately 300 million consumers, 
through the Wolfish Bay Corridor Group, utilizing the port of Wolfish Bay as a key entry and exit point. Commendably, the transit routes into the region are ranked as one of the best on the continent, and the Wolfers Bay Corridor Group is regularly benchmarked as a model. Ports play a crucial role in a country's economy, acting as entry points for domestic, regional, and global trade. Additionally, our seaports have a su substantial impact on local employment, generating jobs directly at the ports and in association, associated industries like trucking and logistics services. Directors of ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, the container terminal at Wolfers Bay has significantly improved Namibia's position in the regional maritime industries, particularly due to its increased handling capacity. This added capacity has the potential to attract larger volume of goods to Namibia and facilitate smoother trade within the region. Namibia's economy has traditionally depended heavily on limited sectors like mining and fishing. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement promotes economic diversification by facilitating trade in a wide range of goods and services. This diversification is essential in mitigating risks and reducing our susceptibility to external shocks, ultimate fostering more stable economic growth. Small and medium-sized enterprises are vital to Namibia's economy, and the African Continental Free Trade Agreement offers them an opportunity to broaden their horizons. The agreement streamlines trade facilitation measures, simplifies customers, customs procedures, and grants access to valuable information, all of which can significantly advantage our small businesses. Directors of ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, I won't spend too much time discussing the numerous possibilities that this agreement holds for Namibia and the Erongo region. In, instead, I look forward to the panel discussions where more insight will be shared about the African continental free trade area and the advantages it can offer in making the Erongo region the preferred gateway to Africa in the rest of the world. To fully capitalize on the advantages of the African continental free trade area, Namibia must take proactive and strategic steps. As a country, we need to prioritize infrastructures development, foster entrepreneurship and innovation, boost our competitiveness, and streamline the business environment. These efforts will enable us to position Namibia as a pivotal center for trade and investment, drawing interest from both local and global stakeholders. As we aspire for the Irongo region to emerge as the preferred gateway to Africa and the globe global stage. Let us explore how the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can positively impact our region and elevate us to greater levels of prosperity and prominence. Director of Ceremony, in conclusion, 
I wish to express my sincere gratitude for your presence at this 19th Dr. Theoben Kurira lecture series once more. I am optimistic that our discussions will be productive and there will be much to gain from it. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next Dr. Theoben Kurira lecture series which will be the 20th lecture series at a venue yet to be determined. With that, I hereby declare the 19th Dr. Theoben Kurirap lecture series officially open. I thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Generally Matundu for the opening remarks in which you outlined what the Africa Free Trade Agreement is all about, Continental Free Trade Agreement is all about, and the immense opportunities it offers, as well as its importance uh, to a relevance to the Arongo region. And the uh, endless opportunities it offers for the SMEs and the other uh, businesses in the region. And a bit of emphasis on what we can look out to, issues such as infrastructure development, streamlining our business uh, you know, environment, making sure that people don't wait long if they come here to register their businesses and all those kinds of things, the red tape. So thank you for that, uh, laying the foundation. I, might be a bit biased, but this is the only opportunity that I normally get. So I would like to introduce the speaker to the region of Erongo, please, honorable speaker. That's Dr. Kachavivi. And, and why I say that is because he is the only qualified person amongst us here today who have worked and who have been in the trenches with Dr. Tio Ben Kurirap. Uh, they've shared so many, so many uh, memories uh, together, and that's why we are deeply honored to have him in, in, in our presence, and also congratulate him on his recent uh, conferment of a doctorate. Congratulations, Doctor. <laughs> I would now uh, call on each panelist to make a short statement before we go into the questions to the panelists. Mr. Tino Hanabe. Yeah, you can just sit there, it's fine. Oh, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Speaker, Honorable Minister, uh, Honorable Councillors, my colleagues, I think it is indeed a privilege and an honor to be part of this uh, public lecture. And as the head of Erongoret, I would like to say that Africa is suffering from energy poverty. Yet we have massive amount of resources. And we always say water is life, education is the greatest enabler, but electricity is the greatest, greatest uh, catalyst. It enables everything. And through addressing electricity access or energy access, we would be able to foster and enable agriculture we will enable and reduce poverty and industrialization. And I believe that electricity access is not negotiable for, for every leader. If you are a leader, you can't negotiate access to electricity. If you look at Namibia, our national average for electricity electrification is 56, but for Erongo region, it's a bit higher, more than 70%. We have about 45,000 clients 
of which 11,000 are subsidized. Africa needs 25 billion US dollars annually to be able to meet its energy demand on an annual basis. Now for us in Erongo region, we need around 300 million Namibian dollars, not annually, fortunately, but at least if we can get 30 to 40 million a year, we will be able to electrify and give greater access to our community. In our region, in terms of projects for electrification that we have, if you look at um, between ourselves and Nambawa, we are probably looking at 300 uh, 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 megawatt that we plan to, to uh, uh, establish or add to the grid. From our side, around 30, 30 megawatt, and the other 270 is for, for Nambawa that includes uh, Khan, Anihas, Omburu, and the Arandes uh, 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 projects. If, if we look at our installed capacity for the region, we are around 120 uh, megawatt, of which currently we are utilizing uh, 105 megawatts that we are using as the region. But as Africa, if we have that energy deficiency, there was a lot of talk about the Inga, Inga Dam. And that I still remember that our founding president always spoke about that Inga Dam. And we are still talking about it. And Honorable Deputy Minister, Speaker, if, if as nations we are talking about the Inga Dam for the past 15, 20 years, having an agreement of this nature, how do we make it meaningful? How do we reintegrate it? And how do we get benefit out of it if we cannot take off that project for the past 20 years? I also want to add that currently, as Namibia, we import electricity. But when you look at those imports, the currency of trade is US dollars, right? So that means that Every year, as the Namibian dollar rent deteriorates against the U.S. currency, the, the, the number of units of kilowatt hours that we import becomes less. So, and the African Continental Free Trade Agreement make a reference to the fact that uh, whilst it was signed at the national and AU level by our leaders, the region, like SADC, ECOWAS, and many other regions must start to integrate and remove those trade and non-trade barriers, right? And also probably start with kind of currencies that we can. Because what we have as a problem, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that we trade, Africa, in the Africa trade is less than 20%. Yet we trade more than 50% of our trade with Europe, and even if you add US, it's more. But all this trade is through US dollars and other currencies. So for us to, in conclusion, for us to achieve this trade agreement, we need to do more. We have recently seen, uh, uh, Speaker, it's good that you are here, Honorable Your Excellency. We have recently seen that if we want to get something done as Namibians, we can do it. Uh, over the past two months or so, we have passed a few bills in, through both houses of parliament. But the bills that we have passed, if I look at it, it, it appears as if it was superimposed on Namibia because of grey listing and many other things. So my question to our leaders and to all of us is, until what time should we only focus on those things that are superimposed on us? Can we use the same level of energy with which we have passed those bills through Parliament to be able to look at our regulations, how we can engage? And, 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 and the Financial Action Task Force is not a country. It's simply an institution that says, look, we'll grey list you, and if you grey list you, you don't have access to funding, right? But yet, we are buying electricity in US dollars from Zambia, 
in Zimbabwe and all the others otherwise. But that's my quest to say, if we have that ability to be able to focus our energy and get things done, and we can do it as a nation, we have seen how much energy is spent on green hydrogen, which is also an enabler for the future. So if we can have so much amount of energy and reorganize and reprioritize, we will get so much done. So with these few words, um, Director of Ceremonies, let me go and take my seat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tino, for the food for thought that you have also given us at the end. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are learning every day new words. Water is life. Now electricity is the greatest catalyst. Um, and the importance of it that you just highlighted and uh, the barriers that are there in terms of currency fluctuations that makes it very difficult, as well as uh, the need to prioritize our own uh, activities in as, over the, um, the international uh, uh, realities that are there. So I think we thank you. I thought I would be asking the questions today, but wait until I come to you. Before we go into uh, the calling up my brother from uh, Namport, let me just highlight a th one thing for the benefit of the young that are here. Amongst the many achievements of Dr. Tio Ben Kurirap was when he was the foreign minister of Namibia and he successfully led three years of negotiations for the reintegration of Wolfies Bay and the offshore islands into the Republic of Namibia. And, and I think this has relevance to my brother who will come up next, because people like Dr. Kachavivi and uh, Dr. Tiovet Kurirap had bigger dreams, and they must be happy. Dr. Kachavivi is testimony that one day when he goes, he will tell, no, there was an Africa uh, 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 continental free trade agreement that took effect. And the Wolf is by was at the core of that agreement. The same Wolf is Bay that you championed to bring back to Namibia is the one that is championing the developments in that. We thank we thank you all for that. Mr. Kanime, please tell us. Honorable Peter Kanchavivi, Speaker of the National Assembly. Uh, actually, my boss from the University of Namibia, though she is, I hope you remember. Um, Honorable Deputy Minister Matundu, Minister, Deputy Minister of uh, International Relations and Cooperation. Honorable Councillors, uh, Captains of Industry present, members of the media, a very, very good morning to you all. I am truly, truly honored and humbled to be one of the speakers and panelists today on this August occasion of the 19th session of the Dr. Theo Ben Gurilab Lecture. The Dr. Theo Ben Gurilab series of lectures are one of the very important events on our national calendar where we take stock of various matters within the spectrum of international relations and cooperation, including assessing the impact that they have on the development of our nation, the realization of national development imperatives, and of course, the sustainability of our peace and stability. Graciously, this year we are hosting this year's lecture in Suakopmund, 
under the theme, how can the African Continental Free Trade Agreement benefit the Erongo region to be the preferred gateway to Africa and the world at large. I'm therefore especially delighted to provide a perspective on the theme for the 19th session and specifically, especially the role that our ports can play to enable Southern Africa, Namibia, and of course the Erongo region to leverage off and actually benefit uh, from the opportunities that are provided by the implementation of the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Africa has over the years predominantly traded with the outside world to its detriment and in fact to the detriment of its own growing population. Recent estimates have put intra-Africa trade at as low as 15%, and that is definitely not sustainable as it actually means the lion's share of trade is actually with the outside world and not with ourselves as a, as a continent. And this have, has of course been on the back of uh, red tape, tariff barriers, and of course none other, uh, other uh, non-tariff barriers. Just to give you a perspective specifically on the intra continental shipping front. This has actually also been aggravated by very high shipping rates. And this is significantly due to the lack of sufficient volumes between African countries to justify and make viable and consistent vessel calls to connect and interlink African countries. Because as you can imagine, if there was to be a direct vessel call, say between Namibia uh, and any of the African countries along, let's say, the west coast of Africa, there need to be sufficient volumes between the two countries for it to be sustainable for you to actually deploy a vessel between the two countries. But now, if I'm saying intra-Africa trade is at a mere 15%, it, it basically means it becomes uneconomical to have direct calls, vessel calls, between ourselves as a continent. And just to emphasize how the situation is actually dire, in a recent study, which was actually conducted to analyze the cost of intra-continental trade, it was found that it cost as much as 6,000 US dollars to move a container from Walvis Bay to Ivory Coast, which is just up the west coast of Africa. However, to ship the same container from Walvis Bay to China in the Far East, it cost 1,400 US dollars, which is about four times less compared to what it cost actually to, to, to ship a vessel, uh, a container to, um, to, to Ivory Coast. Where still, as I said, there's definitely no direct vessel sailing between Namibia and Ivory Coast. And therefore, for a container that is originating, say, from Valves Bay, destined for Ivory Coast, it first has to be shipped as far as uh, to Singapore before it can actually be transshipped back to uh, Ivory Coast. That's how worse the situation actually is. The implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement therefore provides us with an opportunity to significantly increase trade volumes between the two countries. As indicated, by the Deputy Minister, one of the critical objectives of that particular agreement is to remove trade barriers. 
If you remove trade barriers so that we can trade with one another, that provides us with an opportunity to actually increase volumes. As a port, we, we, we serve as a critical node linking Namibia and the rest of the region to the rest of the world. We are an export-based economy, dominated especially by the mining sector, the agricultural sector, and the fishing sector. And without the ports, we would not be able to take these Namibian products to the market. Hence, the port is there. But as part of this broader agreement, we also see ourselves as having a primary responsibility to actually contribute to regional integration. But if I share with you some of the horror stories around, we, we facilitate, for example, evacuation of, um, or export of copper, let's say from Zambia, from DRC to the rest of the world, because those countries do not have access uh, to the sea. Now, you need transportation network to transport this cargo out of uh, the neighboring countries to the port of Alvis Bay so that it can find its way in the international markets. If there are truck, uh, truckers here or entrepreneurs that own um, trucking business, for example, they'll be able to tell you, for example, that uh, for you to get your truck into the Democratic Republic of Congo, as an example. You need to move mountains. You need to spend an arm and a leg because of the significant barriers that exist. As a matter of fact, most Namibian businesses that own um, trucks prefer not to send their trucks into some of these jurisdictions because the cost is simply significant. Therefore, this particular agreement provides us with that opportunity to remove these barriers. Because if these barriers are removed, it opens up opportunities then for us uh, to be able to trade with one another. We are a small economy. It also opens up an opportunity for us to send our goods and products to those bigger markets. Uh, and therefore, this particular lecture series could not have come at, um, at a better opportunity uh, for us as a country, really, uh, to deliberate on how best can we actually play our part to operationalize this particular um, uh, agreement. As I said, I'm um, very delighted to be here uh, to share our perspectives and uh, really just to indicate that in as much as we need the ports, we also need all other players. We need trackers, we need the producers, we need freight forwarders, and we need legislatory authorities to collaborate with us, to actualize and realize the implementation of, of this particular agreement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Kamine, Kanime, for the, uh, your input on, on, on the realities faced by the maritime industry in the country, as well as the barriers, uh, barriers that are there that uh, makes it difficult for some of these things to happen. I am very happy that you also mentioned that uh, in order for us to move forward, some of these barriers have to be removed. Uh, but one of the fundamental things that you have mentioned is that how best can we play our part to make sure that we realize the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as a region, as a local authority, you know, as a business, you know, as a community member out there. Maybe from Ukraine, we don't know. So, thank you very much for that input, and I think uh, the inputs were very valuable. I now have the pleasure to call on uh, Dr. Staitler 
to make his short statement. Thank, thank you, Michael. And, and you forgot to tell the audience that when we were in the trenches, we were young and very thin. <laughs> and those people that believe that Namibia is not better off <laughs> after independence, they should look at Michael and us. You can see we have really <laughs> prospered. Uh, and I wish for all of us prosperity. I was actually surprised today to learn that we speak now of the, the excellent Irongo. The last time I was here with with, with president at a town hall me meeting, it was called the mighty Orongo. So I don't know when that change happened, but, but I also like excellence. Maybe we should say the mighty excellent Irongo region. <laughs> now, um, prior to independence, thousands of Namibians went abroad to fight for the liberation from outside. And there were also three young boys that went and they ended up in, in, the, in the US. And they became very close friends. Uh, honorable speaker will know already who they are. They, they actually were called the trio. And the trio was Dr. Tio Ben Gurirap, Idipo Amatenia, and Haki Kainkop. And therefore, it's kind of befitting that today, on the birthday of one of the trios, that uh, Dr. Theo Ben Gurirap uh, lecture series take place here in the mighty Irongo region. And I would like to, to congratulate the, the Ministry of International Relations for keeping the series alive. This is already the 19th one. Now, I recall when the first one came and the idea was mooted that it should be on a quarterly basis, I was one of the people, Honorable Minister, that was skeptical. I said, you, you, you won't have enough content to keep it alive. Why don't you have an annual public uh, lecture? Uh, because you know, to, to have it on a quarterly basis, it demands a lot of commitment and therefore applaud to the Ministry of International Relations for already having organized the 19th one. <laughs> so the, where we are, to put in context the, the, the idea of a free trade area, it, it didn't start five years ago or, or even 10 years ago. In fact, the founding fathers of the African continent, they had foresight where they started to dream of what we call a common market, the Africa Union. The idea is that Africa Union should be a common market. And I will later, uh, kind of explain the difference between a free trade area and a common market. Because this is eventually where, where we, that we should be targeting to have a common market in Africa. Just like the United States of America, it's a common market. Uh, so, so the difference between a free trade area and a common market is that a common market is a deeper form of integration. And it's only when you have a common market that we will really see that intra-trade flourish. And mind you, it's not only intra-trade in goods, because here we think of goods, but the future is about services. So it must also be trade in services. This is where the real value is. And one of the benefits with services is the mode of delivery. Uh, some of the services, Andrew, uh, you don't have to deliver through a truck. You can deliver it through a click of a button. You can sit in India and do excellent programming overnight and send it to America. It's an export. So, so we, we have to also incorporate services and we have to, 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 to move towards a real common market. So, but for now, we should at least celebrate the fact that we have concluded the Africa Free Trade Agreement, continental, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I think applaud should also go to the Namibian government because Namibia was one of the first countries to ratify it in parliament. Uh, for the Africa Free Trade Agreement to take effect, it had to be ratified by a certain number of countries. And it was only in 21 that sufficient numbers of countries ratified it and it could become a free trade area. There are still some, some member countries that have not 
ratify the free trade area and we should call upon those countries to also ratify the free trade area. Because maybe the markets, the goods that we can export are exactly in those countries that are not part of the free trade area yet because they have not ratified the free trade area agreement. Uh, why is trade so important? Uh, tra trade is important if you look in history, the time where there was most prosperity on an interval basis is where countries have gone for trade liberalization. Uh, when China, for example, joined the World Trade Organization, it really changed the game and it, 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 it contributed to a lot of prosperity, not only for China, but also globally. And, and therefore, it's important for us to, to, to celebrate the concept of the Africa free trade area. And we should really applaud our leaders that have moved quickly on, on doing it. Uh, but, there's, there's always a but. And, 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 and part of my but is to, 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 to give now suggestions on how the Erongo region can, can benefit from the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So, so one of the buts is that we have to learn from previous cases. We, and we have to learn locally, but also internationally. So if you look at, if you look at, at locally, you know that in 2008, SADC countries came together and they signed the SADC, SADC Trade Protocol. And SADC has been having a free trade area for almost 15 years now. So, so we, we should look at why is it then uh, Andrew and uh, Tino cited the low levels of intra-Africa trade. But even just at SADC, there's a low level of intra-SADC trade. It's, it's more or less the same percentage. It's about 15, 20%. So, so why after 15 years, though 15 years of free trade experience, just in our sub-region, why after 15 years are we not seeing that benefit of intra sadic trade, which will then lead to to, to prosperity, to growth and prosperity. Why is it that we, that we, we still see skewed trade? Uh, let's, let's, not, let's, let's even go a level lower from SADC to SACO. So SACO is a deeper form of integration than SADC, economic integration, because there we have really free movement of goods. And there's also, there's also some issue in the CMA there's also currency that's moving freely. But, but what we see is that Namibia has a massive trade deficit with South Africa, and it's not reducing. And all of the other southern countries have a massive trade deficit with South Africa, and it's not reducing. So here, here is one of the, 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 the key things that, that SADC has learned, and that we should also replicate at a at a continental level, is that the other side of a coin, if, if trade is one side of a coin, then the other side of the coin is industrialization. So you need simultaneously to have, with a trade policy, you must have an industrial policy. So our industrial policy has uh, been, I think it has expired, and it has not been reviewed and renewed in, for years now. I think here my advice would be to, to the Namibian authorities, to the government, is really to, to speed up the development of our industrial policy. Because in, if, if, you don't, if you don't have industries, what are you going to trade? So here is the key question for me. When, when we have free trade, we see countries. I see Egypt, I see Kenya, I see Nigeria, I see Namibia. And here we want to go to a level even lower to the Eronga region. Is it a region that should be the best? Is it a country that should be the best? I can formulate it differently when it comes to competitiveness. 
uh, Honorable Minister spoke of competitiveness. And many people say uh, Namibia is not competitive. But is it Namibia that's competing with Kenya, for example, or with the South Africans? If, if, you, if you think of it differently, it's actually enterprises that compete with enterprises somewhere else. It's a Namibian company that will compete with a company that sits somewhere else in the world. And it's the Namibian company that must be competitive and that must be able to move the product to whether it's in Africa or the rest of the world. And so we have to look at how, what we can do to strengthen our enterprises so that our enterprises are, are able, are able to, to export whether it's within Africa or whether it's in the rest of the world. And, and we have to change our mindset. So, so one, one of the things, if you look at it's the Africa continental free trade area is actually the last one in the world currently. If, if you look at the example of ASEAN, the Asian free trade area, and you have NAFTA, beautiful examples we can look at. So with, 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 when, when, when ASEAN came, so what, what the Chinese, for example, did to, 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 to boost their export potential, they did not reinvent the wheel. They actually partnered. They partnered even with American companies, and they took Chinese products everywhere in the world, first in Asia. And later, the Vietnamese are partnering with the, with the Chinese, and they take product. So, so, so here we have to be open-minded and we have to say that if we want to benefit from, from the Africa free trade area, we should change our mindsets and partner with companies that can come and locate in the Erongo region, for example, and then move the product from the Erongo region. And we, we have now an abundance of opportunities where we can, you know, I see three Three, three good things in the Erongo region uh, that you should use to, to position the Erongo region. One is about 2011 census, I still recall I was the statistician general, I looked at the census figures and I made a presentation on, on migration because there's also migration between regions. And and I, I, I told one audience that the Irongo region for me is like the United States of America. The Irongo region is like the United States of America. And they asked me, why do you say that? And, and the reason I say it is because the United States of America, there are some people, they think it belongs to them. But everybody except the native Indians, they came to the United States of America. So now, if you, look at a, if you look at the Irongo region, and the, and the data s supports it, it shows that if I have to, if we can do an exercise now, and I just ask whose parents were originally born here, or grandparents, and who just came very recently, I think many hands will go up. They say only about 25% <laughs> of the Irongo inhabitants are originally from Irongo. Their parents, great parents were here and they were born here and they grew up here. But the majority are coming to the Erongo region. And they come from everywhere. They come from the south, they come from the north, they come from the east, they come from the west. So that makes a nice mix of people in the Erongo region. So where, where you have, where you have immigra immigration, so there are a lot of immigrants here. <laughs> America is built by immigrants. So Erongo has also a lot of immigrants. <laughs> So make use of the immigrants, uh, they are Namibians. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a point. Uh, but, but that's the beauty, you know, that the diversity is here. So that's number one. Number two, we see Rongo, Rongo has huge potential, is that if you, if you can stand here where I'm standing, you see young people, young people, and I see some of them in blue overalls. It means they will become artisans. So countries are built not by doctors like myself, that are theorists. 
if a light bulb goes up now, they won't call Dr. Staitler, I will call one of those artisans, <laughs> or we wouldn't call Professor Peter <laughs> to come and change it. So, so a lot of, lot of young people, skilled people. Irongo has also a lot of resources. Irongo, one of the, the resources that has become now exceedingly important is the resource of, of the sun and water and this year the Rongo region. We speak of green hydrogen that will, that will transform how Namibia will look like. And the big discussion is when, when people look at a, at a proposed valleys for the for a hydrogen, everybody looks at, I hope they're not people from Karas, they look at the Karas region. But it's also the, the Irongo Valley. And guess what? Of the four pilot projects in green hydrogen, the one that's the one that's making the fastest project progress currently is at Daures in the Erongo region. It's not in the Karas region. And so Erongo, the Erongo hydrogen valley has tremendous potential. And, and you, have to, you have to see how you can do that. Daures valley, uh, Daures village, is, and it's from a village level. You know, when, when you have economic development that doesn't come from the top, but from the village, not even from the constituency, but from the village. Imagine the prosperity that you can create. So Daurus Valley tells me that even before they've produced green ammonia, the people in Africa, Zimbabwe, already wants green ammonia. It was one of the great opportunities in Africa. Uh, Tino cited electricity. But one of the great opportunities in Africa is agriculture. African population is growing, it's hungry, it needs food. But to grow food, you need fertilizer. And these fertilizers can come right here from, from the Irongo region. But you have to go and, and look for partners. Irongo region is also, in a way, maybe you guys don't look at it like that, but the way I look at it, I see governments since the fourth uh, NDP has started to prioritize the Irongo region. Because it was during the fourth NDP that government has decided to come up with priority sectors. And one of it was to say Namibia should become a logistics nation. And the logistics nation starts right here in Irongo. And therefore, if you look at all the significant capital projects that have been implemented, it was actually here at the Irongo region. Because the, the government has already, made, has already said Namibia should be the gateway. But where does that gateway start? If you have a gateway, imagine you have a gateway and there's a portal, then the portal of the gateway is the Irongo region. And, and, and so you have all these nice things that are happening for you uh, with, within the Irongo region that you should benefit, uh, that you should use to leverage, to, to, to access this Africa continental free trade area. Uh, at a policy level, I, I also want, and, and it's a pity the Ministry of Trade and Industry is not here, that, that we need, we need to, to look not only at the free trade agreement, but we need to look at a concept that we call trade facilitation. And my brother, Andrew, uh, talked about it. He talked about the bottlenecks in, in, in transport. It's, it's not just roads that's difficult, but it's, it is a, uh, Imagine if you have to move a good from here to, to Kenya. I, imagine the number of customs procedures that you have to go through. So here I want to applaud the government again. Recently, I understood, uh, maybe Gilbert would touch on it, I understood that we've opened up the, one of our immigration points with, with Botswana for 24 hours. But we've gone a step further that if you, if you move goods, it's just certified on one side. You, you don't have to pull a truck in Namibia, check the goods, pull the truck in Botswana, check the goods. So we must, we must standardize customs clearances, customs procedures. And, and this is a policy issue for me. This should happen when we attend the SADC meetings, the AU meetings, that we say we want to see common procedures, we want to see standardization, and, and we also have to interrogate, I'm concluding with this one, I've used too much 
But uh, we, w one of the reasons why, 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 why the, the SADC trade is very low is because of two concepts, or many, but I want to highlight two. It's what we call rules of origin. So, so, so in order to, in order to, 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 to really export your good, sometimes some of the rules of origin may be questioned. And they say this rule of origin is not, it's not sufficient transformation that took place. So we have to look at, at the rules of origin. I don't know if there are issues with, with this one, but with Sadek it was. And then there's one thing to, to be classified as a free trade area by the WTO. You must liberalize only 90% of your trade. So what happens often is that that 10% that's not liberalized is actually where the opportunity is to trade. Because countries come up then with their defensive list. Uh, we will say our defensive list is beer. <laughs> My goodness. Then we say beer, we can't get beer from other places. No, other countries also say my defensive list is also beer. Because maybe in East Africa they also drink beer. So now we can't trade beer between Namibia and Kenya. But guess what? One of the best ways to trade is actually not to trade things that people, that people don't have. It's, it's to trade things that we both have. You know, if, 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 if I know that people drink beer, and they know that I drink beer, we can start to trade. Because we don't have to test the market. I will just make my beer better. I package it better and, and I export my beer. And this is actually backed by, backed by international theory. The professor that won a Nobel Prize on why countries that have the same products can trade is, is, is Professor Friedman. And he showed it in the case of Europe. If you go, to, if you go to, to Germany, they have cheese. If you go to Holland, they have cheese. If you go to France, they have cheese. And, but because all of them eat cheese, it's easy to, to trade in cheese. Now we want to say, oh, I must produce something that, I, that they don't have. So, so, so let's start. And let's start also to make it easier to do, Honorable Minister, to do the cross-border trade. Because the cross-border trade is where our families live. And finally, I'm now sounding like a, a pastor, finally, finally. I said, it's enterprises that trade. But the critical thing that we, we must also understand, at the end of the day, is people that are coming together. And we must make it easier for the African people to move. I applaud here again the government that has now extended a number of countries where they can get a visa at a, at, upon arrival. But we must, we must promote that movement of people because it's when I meet a colleague from Zimbabwe, I say, wow, what are you guys doing? Can't we do business? Yes, we do business. So, so there are a lot of opportunities for for the Erongo region and also for Namibia. Thank you, I've overextended my stay, Michael, but, <laughs> but since, since the other three colleagues are from the Erongo region and it's only uh, uh, Deputy Minister and I, we're not from here, so I think we should get more time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Stadler, for that. Uh, input from yourself. I think we have taken note, I think people have taken note of the economic lecture that you have given, breaking it down in layman's language, you know, so that each and everyone can understand and not left behind. So thank you very much for that. But uh, one, of the, one of the things that you mentioned that uh, really touched home was the fact that you encourage companies to start partnering with companies in other countries, you know. And then also, normally what we do in the Erongo region, we take migration as a very negative thing because it impacts on our resources. But you just clearly outlined, it's a positive thing as well, you know. It's good, it's a good mix because you have skilled people and all those uh, that are coming into your, to your region. The young people of Erongo, 
Yes, we have many young people in the region. They are the majority. As well as the fact that we have ample resources of sun and water that we need to utilize and take advantage of. Case in point, the green hydrogen valley in the Daures constituency. We need really people. Let's go there. Let's see. Let's, let's learn, you know. It is in within our region. Um, the fact that uh, the logistics hub, it starts here in Erongo region, not in other places, but here in Erongo region. Of course, there are other issues that we also raised, more high level economic issues, such as the rules of origin, as well as the issues of trade liberalization, you know. So those are the things that we need to look at. But more importantly, let this discussion not end here. Let us as a region from here sit down and unpack these things and take it on if we will really want to make uh, this trade agreement works for us. Without wasting time, I now would like to call on the last panelist to make his few uh, remarks. Thank you very much. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Deputy Minister, the Director of Proceedings, please allow me also to stand on the established protocol in the interest of time. Uh, it is also a distinct privilege and honor for me to be part of this public lecture. Uh, Director of Proceedings, also allow me to extend our sincere apologies on behalf of Mr. Mbahupu Hippi Shivikwa, the CEO of the Walthus Bekorido Group, who unfortunately couldn't attend this event since he's on official mission in one of our neighboring countries. Now, Honorable Speaker, before I start with my talk, Honorable Deputy Minister and Director of Proceedings, I can assure you that if I had the chance to speak before Mr. Emmanuel Hanaweb, I might have also argued that transport and logistics is actually the, trans the catalyst for other sectors of the economy, but today I will allow the energy sector to take the limelight. <laughs> now, upon Namibia's independence, we were relatively isolated as a country from the rest of the SADC region, and there is a historical context to that narrative. However, shortly after our independence, our government uh, took concerted efforts, and they essentially uh, invested in the road infrastructure to close the missing links uh, to Botswana, to Zambia, and also to Angola. Because at the time of independence, we essentially only had physical links to South Africa. We have seen also uh, the establishment of the Walfus Bay Corridor Cruise, uh, Corridors, which is essentially a transport network of four transport corridors that extends and links the port of Walfus Bay with our landlocked neighbors like Botswana, Zambia, DRC, and so on. And in 2012, uh, the uh, Namibian government introduced the logistics hub master plan with the launch of NDP4, uh, which is essentially Namibia's strategic and new game plan in terms of how best we want to transform and diversify our, our economy in, through value-added industrialization. So the master plan really hinges on the implementation of various NDPs, starting with NDP4, NDP5, and in future, uh, NDP6. Now, in terms of trade facilitation, which Dr. Stadler spoke about, there's quite a number of things to be considered. Because in international trade, cross-border facilitation is really the central point of corridor development. So if we look, for instance, uh, at our borders, most of our borders, in fact, all our borders were established before independence. So in terms of its configuration, in terms of its layout and the structure of our borders, they are not really designed to handle the kind of volumes that we are seeing today. So they have, are completely inadequate in terms of design, configuration, and setup to respond to the demands that are 
uh, coming from our neighboring countries and the kind of volumes that we've seen channeled through our ports. And for that reason, there is need for the establishment of what they call one-stop border posts, where you see a single facility either in one country serving both nations, or you have what they call a stratted facility that is spent uh, across the two neighboring countries. So uh, we, we have taken note, uh, especially in the confines of the Logistics Hub Master Plan, uh, which I'm sure the speaker is also very well aware of, because this project is supported uh, at cabinet level and we periodically report on the progress of this report, uh, of this master plan to our steering committee and also to the different cabinet committees. So if we look at our border infrastructure, one of the key elements is really 24-hour border operations. And we must applaud our government for recently pioneering the uh, launch of 24-hour border operations at Transkalahari, which is often referred to as Baitopos, and Botswana. Now, before the 24-hour operations, I was there in March, and we saw a significant number of trucks piled up in the no-man's land area, or what you call the buffer zone, which is not I the ideal kind of scenario that you would want to see. And then I was fortunate again last uh, two weeks ago, where after returning from Botswana. That is now after the installation and launching of the 24-hour border operations, and there were virtually no trucks in the 24-hour, in that buffer zone. So you can tell from these kind of developments that it really eases trade, it facilitates seamless movement, border crossings, and so on. If I have to take you to, for instance, to Kazumbaleza now, both Mr. Hanabeb and Mr. Kanime were fortunate to visit that border. That is the border between Zambia and DRC. At that border, we have a line of trucks for 70 to 80 kilometers. Imagine trucks all the way from Banduk to Okahanja in one straight line and with no way to pass. That is the magnitude of trade that we see and when your border infrastructure is not designed and your equipment, your facilities and those kind of things are not geared to handle the volume of trade, then you end up with that kind of scenario. Now, we, 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 we have, as part of the corridor development, we've signed agreements and again I must applaud our government. Uh, we've signed an agreement with Namibia, Zambia and DRC on the Wolfers Bay Ndola Lubumbashi development to facilitate trade along that corridor. We have a similar agreement that we have signed uh, as a country with Botswana and South Africa to facilitate trade on the trans Kalahari corridor which goes through Botswana and to South Africa. So when you have these kind of agreements, it really enables you to engage your neighboring countries on issues of rules of origin that Dr. Statler also mentioned it allows you to engage your neighbors in terms of common infrastructure that can facilitate trade, whether it is roads, whether it is rail, and there are discussions between our neighboring countries and Namibia in terms of the trans Zambezi railway development, the trans Kalare railway development between Namibia and Botswana, which will eventually relieve the pressure on our road. Now, I, um, let me pause there for a minute. Our roads, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, in terms of the quality infrastructure, is currently ranked number one on the African continent and 23rd, 23rd globally. So we are ahead of countries like South Africa, Botswana, Rwanda, and many others. And our roads are effectively compared with roads in Spain, Canada, and those kind of first world countries. So it, it takes enormous resources to maintain that kind of infrastructure. But if we allow the inefficiency in one mode of transport, like, road, uh, uh, like the railway infrastructure, that will completely negate all the gains that we have made in terms of our road infrastructure. So we, as a government and as state-owned enterprises and private sector, we continuously have to strike a healthy balance in terms of those different modes of transport. And when you have a port like Wolfers Bay, which is one of our flagship ports, 
And it is really geared that in the foreseeable future, there will be significant amount of volumes coming through our port. In fact, we are working with experts from Japan who are predicting that in five years' time, we may see a threefold increase of trucks on our roads if we don't continue to invest in our railway infrastructure. So when we, when we look at the Logistics Hub Master Plan, we are obviously also taking cognizance of key enablers and uh, strategic uh, or critical success factors, if I can put it like that, where we are also looking at aspects of incentives for bonded warehouses, for 24-hour border operations, and also embracing ICT, where you are now looking at digitalizing your operations at the borders, digitalizing your operations at the your way bridges, and so on, and of course also at the port. So taking cognizance of this, and before I take my seat, uh, now, by the way, uh, the Wolfers Bay Corridor Group, contrary to what some believe, is actually not based in the Rongo region. Our office is in Bantu. So for that reason, I do echo the sentiments of Dr. Staitler that I should probably also ask for some additional allowance. <laughs> but I'll be done in a few minutes. Briefly on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. In the context of international trade and at the backdrop of the Africa Union Agenda 2063, which is basically Africa's strategic blueprint and master plan for transforming the Africa into a global powerhouse of the future, especially in terms of the Africa we want. We have, uh, and obviously, following the signing of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, that, in our view, really sets the stage for small and open economies like Namibia and Botswana and others to have access to a larger market. And as of today, it is estimated that the African population is at 1.4 billion. That is the market that we access as a small economy like Namibia. And when you have pioneering and emerging industries like the green hydrogen, as well as oil and gas, which if well developed and structured, really would be significant game changers to diversify Namibia's economic landscape and also generate economic spin-offs. In conclusion, let me uh, latch on to the comments from Dr. Staitler and say that in terms of the green hydrogen landscape, three of the major green hydrogen projects are located in the Erongo region. Imagine if these projects are well structured, well developed, incentivized, with clear outlines in terms of downstream beneficiation for SME participation in terms of the backward and forward linkages. Imagine what that would do to our communities, to our societies, and so on. So it's, I'm, I'm just really applauding our government for supporting these kind of initiatives that will stimulate economic activities for other sectors of the economy. And of, of course, if you look at Erongo region with the port and the transport corridors, is really well positioned to be the gateway in terms of facilitating this kind of trade. So with that, I so submit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Boyce, for the input. I think now we have heard it all from all the presenters. I think uh, Mr. Boyce basically emphasized the importance that our infrastructural designs should respond to the needs that are on the ground. And the fact that the government has done a lot to really ensure um, that we have adequate facilities to do trade and to have cross-border movements. I think the initiative such as the recently opened 24-hour border operations is one such that you mentioned. But, uh, and something that has also come out from all the panelists, is most of them is the digitalization aspect. 
I think in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, I think those are key things that we really need to concentrate on. And uh, once again, emphasis is on the green hydrogen project. You know, three in the Rongo region. And you know what that could mean for the Rongo region? Uh, employment creation, yes. And all the other benefits that comes from it. So we just, we, we just heard now from the panelists and uh, as, I wa as they were speaking, I could also hear, and I'm, I know you picked up as well, the, the, the opportunities for the Erongo region. So I would not go into that and go straight into the straight questions. And unfortunately, I must start with the Honorable Deputy Minister. Uh, what are the investment opportunities, uh, what, what efforts has the government put in place to raise awareness about the African Free Trade Continental Agreement. You may sit where you are. You don't need to come here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Master Moderator. The efforts that the government has uh, put in place of what the government is doing, the topic at hand or the Africa continental free trade area is more under the Ministry of Industrialization and Trade. And with that ministry, there are really clear policies set. And uh, in my opening statement, I have also talked about the national plan that each and every country or member state is expected to come up with their own that will fit their own uh, uh, kind of ideologies. So really the measures are there and visible. And uh, again, this part of the lecture series that we are sitting here today is also part and parcel of raising awareness to inform the communities. That's why you are seeing us now bringing it in this form, going to region by region with uh, uh, topics, different topics depends on what we have picked. But the fact that we are here today talking about the Africa continental free trade area is part and parcel of raising the awareness or letting the community know of what is happening around the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. I will not play a devil's advocate role today and not follow up with a question, but instead I will go and pose a question to Dr. John Statler. Of course, for the benefit of doubt, I didn't want to say where he is now. He will tell us himself <laughs> at an appropriate time. Uh, Dr. Statler. What are the current trade barriers in the existing legislative framework and how should Namibia go around with eliminating them? I, I must say that Namibia is currently in the process of eliminating these trade, trade barriers. And Namibia is actually quite in the, in the forefront. Uh, if, if you look at where we are starting from, we start from SACO, which is the oldest customs union, and there are frequent consultations. Uh, we, we also, uh, we also part of SADC, and within the context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, there's also the AU, where there are various initiatives other, other than, uh, than the than trade, uh, where we speak of the Africa we want uh, but Namibia has also acceded to the Africa peer review mechanism, which is quite important because one of the key instruments uh, that, that's out there is, is NEPAT that supports the, the funding of cross-border projects. And if, if, we can, if we can get into some of those cross-border projects, we can actually unleash funding uh, to solve a lot of the infrastructure challenges that we have. Uh, I know, for example, there's talks between Angola and, and Namibia on energy. 
to, to develop uh, uh, more hydro capacity. So, so, so I, I must say the trade barriers in, I don't see too many trade barriers. I think we have to look more at the domestic business environment. So this is where I see more challenges. Uh, it's, it's, it's still extremely difficult for, for businesses uh, from different perspectives. Uh, if, if you take, for example, in some countries, they, you, can, you can register a business these days in less than a day. Not so long ago, it, the standard was a day, but now in some jurisdictions, you can register a business in two, two hours. Uh, in, in other countries that have been far behind Namibia, they have overtaken us. It is now quicker to register business in Angola. Many Namibians are actually looking at Angola to, to register businesses there, and they find the experience is, 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 is better. Uh, the, the, the trade barriers that we see is often more non-trade barriers because the tariffs are keep on coming down. But the, the, the trade barriers are there, they are like sanitary measures, phytosanitary measures, uh, and it's more actually on the trade facilitation. This is, this is where we should pay trade and investment facilitation, where we should try to make it, streamline it, and just make it easier. Thank you. Mr. Andrew Kanime. How can the maritime industry benefit from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? Of course, you have, in your int short introduction, highlighted a few of them. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. I think, in addition to what I have um, actually said earlier, hmm, how, how can the maritime industry, or in fact the Erongo region, which is the theme of this, um, lecture city benefit from the, uh, the the implementation of the free African continental free trade area yeah. in the first place would certainly enable us to have access right to a bigger market. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the key challenges that we face, I think, as a country, is the fact that because we are small, most investors shy away actually from coming to invest here. Yes, we have a political, um, eh? we have a stable political environment. Uh, we've got a conducive business environment, I think, in relation to many uh, jurisdictions. But one of the challenges that we have is, is the numbers. Somebody wants to come and set up here, uh, maybe a factory for Toyota, right? The environment is conducive, but then the numbers. Now, if this particular uh, agreement is actually implemented. It enables us to access this bigger market, right? So it will make it attractive for investors, obviously, to come and set up shop here. At the same time, partner with local businesses, create employment for locals, because in addition to the conducive uh, environment, we are now actually able to access the, the bigger market. That's, that's one. Number two, uh, I said one of our critical role is obviously to, we say there's a, a critical link between the region, Namibia, uh, and the rest of the world. Now, simplistically, the bigger the volumes that we move through the port of Walvis Bay, as an example, the more the opportunities for the rest of the economy. Because increased volumes that are actually going through the port of Alves Bay actually means, uh, simplistically, he was talking about a, a, a long list of trucks, right? Or a long queue of, of, of trucks. The more trucks, for example, would be required to transport uh, this cargo, the more drivers we require. The more fuel would, for example, be required to ensure that these trucks are actually able to move uh, uh, cargo the more our local economy within the region will benefit. Accommodation facilities will boom, right? Consumables, the retail sector, will absolutely benefit. And therefore, employment creation is, one another, it, it, it's also one of the outcome uh, of, of the implementation of this particular 
uh, agreement. Directly, of course, as a port, we contribute then to the fiscus in more taxes, but also indirectly, there are so many other industries that are actually dependent upon the activities within the port. If you go to Valves Bay, even here in uh, uh, Swakopmund, look at the number of entities, entrepreneurs, and businesses whose lifeline is actually cargo that is moving through the port of Valves Bay. So if we can actually increase that, then it actually means Erongo as a region, Namibia as a country, we stand obviously to benefit more. But of course, all of us have a critical role to play, as I yeah. said, because we need to create that conducive uh, uh, environment. When truckers come here, when members of the community might be going uh, through stones, as an example to these truckers, it makes a wrong region, it makes our country unattractive. So, so those are some of the things that, because when we talk about creating a conducive environment, we tend to look at uh, government, where is the infrastructure, but all of us, even trackers, uh, you know, cost effectiveness is, is absolutely key. If you charge higher prices, uh, importers and exporters will route or reroute their cargo to other uh, uh, um, uh, ports, obviously within the uh, region. So I think in summary, really, uh, all I can say is that um, if we can get to the actual implementation of this agreement, it can only actually benefit us. We probably stand to benefit much more uh, as a country, given uh, the fact that um, our small economy, you know, uh, once this is implemented, becomes a thing of the past because uh, we would now be able to establish competitive and sustainable businesses because of the access that we have to other um, markets. Okay. Thank you. Back to Dr. Stadler. No, uh, there are fears of significant traffic revenue losses and an uneven distribution of costs and benefits are among the main obstacles on the continent's integration. What can we do to align all these things? Well, firstly, I, I think we, we have to tell people that those fears are unsubstantiated. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there will be massive revenue losses. There will be, because tariffs have been coming down for, for since the gut. And uh, we're at a level where t we don't depend so much on, on revenue from tariffs. And, but where countries still heavily depend on revenue fr from, from tariffs, I, I think it's good then to look at, at, a, at a tax system in general. And here the concept of broadening the tax base is important. So if, in the case of Namibia, we collect about uh, almost 30% in relation to GDP of tax. And a part of it comes from taxes on trade. So, so Namibia is a bit better off. There are some countries, they, they depend heavily on on the, on the tax from, from trade. And sometimes it's linked to one, one commodity. So, so it will be up to each and every country to, to come up with a plan on how to, how to diversify the collection and broaden the tax base. Uh, and I think Namibia here is already one of the, the, the countries that has shown that it can happen. Mm. But the collection and the broadening is one thing. Now, we must also look, you mentioned the issue of uh, inequalities. So we must also look at the progressivity of tax so that we, that people that, 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 that can contribute more should contribute more. And people that are not in a position to contribute, they should pay less tax. Uh, it, it would appear to me that in the case of Namibia that our, our tax is relatively progressive. Uh, I don't think, I think maybe we could bring more progressivity into the tax, but, but generally you find that uh, apart maybe from the vet that every, where everybody is equal, that we have a progressive tax system. And, and my advice would be for each and every country to, to, to look at the tax system and, and to reduce reliance on, 
on revenue from, 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 from trade in goods in particular. Uh, we should also look at, sometimes we, we don't want to, we are critical, but we look at uh, one of the taxes that the Namibian government has seen where the government is losing taxes through e-commerce. Uh, you said that your computer order a book, boom, your book is here and you don't pay tax on it. Uh, in other countries, you actually, the, the, the operator collects the tax on behalf of government. And so this, this is how you then replace your tax. As you see your tax is coming down from one source, then you replace it gradually. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boys, what is the Wolfies Bay Corridor Group doing to ensure that there is uh, proper coordination between road, rail, sea, and air transport stakeholders to ensure that strain is not put on one of the, uh, over the other, you know. Uh, and one is not to the detriment of the, uh, of the other. For example, we have a proper road to network while the rail network is not yet there. Could you tell us, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, following an established track record that we've had in terms of corridor development. Uh, and here I must recognize our central government, our state-owned enterprises like Namport, Transnamab Roads Authority, uh, Road Fund Administration, amongst others, who are part of the Wolfers Bay Corridor Group because we are a public-private partnership oh. consisting of both public and private sector stakeholders to start with. So given that setup, we are fortunate to rely on our public entities in terms of policy and regulatory guidance and insight. And we are also at the same time relying on our private sector to realize the business. So that is the normal uh, order of business for the Wolfers Bay Corridor Group since our establishment in 2000. And we have been working with all the stakeholders in the public and the private sector domain to facilitate trade, to develop business for our ports and for our industries, and also to foster for and lobby for infrastructure development. Now, in, so that was since 2000. In 2011, uh, at the, with the advent of the formulation of NTP4, uh, the Namibian government found itself at the crossroad to interrogate the previous NTPs, NTP 1, 2, and 3, who were largely uh, focusing on mining, agriculture, and those kind of extractive sectors. But given the significant capital outlay and foreign exposure and shocks of these industries, we've not really seen a lot of uh, broad-based kind of development in terms of employment, poverty reduction. So the government, uh, through the National Planning Commission at the time, uh, approached the Japanese government to assist with some kind of high-level survey to really look at the previous NTPs and, pro and propose a new strategy going forward. Uh, so the government then, with the NTP4, to narrow the focus to only four priority sectors, being agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, and logistics. Hence, the uh, development of the Logistics Hub uh, Master Plan, which was basically now a new game plan for Namibia that we introduced with NTP4 in order to <coughs> reduce our dependence on other ports and be at the forefront of providing a logistic solution to other neighboring countries. Before our NTP4 and before corridor development, uh, most of our landlocked neighboring countries like Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, DRC, and Malawi were largely dependent on South Africa and Dar es Salaam as the main uh, traditional ports. So with Wolfers Bay coming on the scene, we changed the landscape of logistics in becoming an alternative. And now I'm looking at Mr. Kanime, 
we are actually becoming a preferred trade route. In the beginning, we were just an alternative, but it took concerted efforts on both public and private sector to change that narrative and to really become a formidable player in terms of transport and logistics. So in terms of the master plan, just briefly on that, uh, the master plan really identified priority investments in terms of the different modes of transport. So for instance, in terms of the road network, the master plan only identified some key sections from Swakopmund to Kariweb and from Kariweb to Oshivarankop because that part of the road network really forms the center of our corridors where the bulk of your freight volumes are, are channeled. So the, the master plan was arguing that yes, there are many other priorities for Namibia as a country in terms of NDP4, but if you cascade it down to master plan level, the focus was focus only on the priority sections in terms of road, and then you can do others at a later stage. In terms of rail, uh, the argument was to upgrade the Walfers Bay Kranzberg section, and there I must applaud our government because we have recently concluded the Walfers Bay Kranzberg railway upgrade. Uh, and the others will obviously follow at a later stage. There are also some developments in the aviation space uh, where Namibia is now talking to major players. There are some players like Air France who have expressed interest to start serving Namibia and they are now negotiating the offering from the Namibian side. I was fortunate to participate in that meeting last week. And uh, should a player like that come to Namibia, that will really connect us very well in terms of source markets in Europe and, and stuff like that. And of course, there are other players like uh, Emirates uh, and also uh, the airline from Swiss who are also talking to us in that space. So finally, I can only say that the Walfers Bay Corridor Group as the implementing agency of the master plan is really coordinating the working groups of the master plan because we have an implementation structure that was approved by cabinet which basically outlines working groups and one of the working groups is road and rail and there we essentially take stock of what has been done in terms of roads what has been done in terms of rail in order to give that kind of progress updates to cabinet i will submit there and Thank Stop you. There for now. Thank you. My last question to the last panelist before I open up for the public audience to participate, to ask questions, clarifications, is to Mr. Tino Hanabeb. Hanabeb, what envisaged benefits will pro private power generator generators in the Erongo region accrue from the implementation of the Africa, free, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement through modified through the modified single buyer framework? Yeah, I think let me, let me start by saying, before I get to Africa, continental free trade, is that what is that that people want as citizens? People simply want security of uh, electricity supply uh, with no load shedding and no fears. And uh, secondly, is the lowest cost for electricity supply. Those are the two things that people want. And every investor that wants to come and settle or put up their facility has that interest that uh, they will get the required electricity at the connection point that they want. And when you look at uh, Erongo region, we, have, um, we currently have access capacity or adequate capacity to be able even more than uh, close to 50 megawatt of additional capacity that we can connect any other person that currently wants. But over and above that, I've also indicated that between ourselves and, uh, and, and, and NAMPOWER, uh, uh, there is those projects ongoing uh, to add additional 300 megawatts to the current uh, capacity just within this region. If I talk about number, they probably have their own other projects elsewhere across the country. Uh, but when it comes to MSB, MSB allows uh, contestable clients, those are clients that are having or using more than one megawatt of electricity to be able to generate their own electricity, about 30%. So 
the private sector or the IPPs through that can then participate to generate electricity to sell to, to those clients that are so registered with Electricity Control Board. And hopefully with them coming on board, there will be a competition and that might lower or reduce the cost of electricity. And therein lies the benefit to be able to attract the, the other investors that wants to come to our market to be able to get electricity at an affordable price, which is reliable. And I think we provide reliable and affordable electricity at this point in time. So I submit Director of Ceremonies. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite participants from the floor to ask questions and those who are online to also pose questions. Before that, before I allow, let me just have, I've, I've got one from online that I quickly want to read and I want the panelists to note. This is uh, from an SME in Omaruru, Honorable Weather, and my brothers here. Namibia has a small population and we as a country do not produce a lot of goods. Won't the Africa Free Trade agreement kill the SMEs in the country? It's just one question. Now I'm opening the floor for questions from the... Uh, okay, that hand was up for a while. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Director of Ceremony. Uh, before my input, I would like just to raise my concern. Translation. Yes, because really we manage, to, we try to mobilize the elder to be here, mm. but they are left out. So we have a, a slogan of say for the uh, Harambe. Inclusivity. Say, yeah? Inclusivity. Nobody feel left out. Yeah. And then we are African. When we are talking African, we must mean it. We cannot just concentrate on English, but we must also look to our, uh, our elders. So my input Organizers. just... No, uh, no, we take note of that. Okay, please, yeah. in future, please. Mm. Okay, I would like just to add what... Uh, yeah. <laughs> We are not attending meeting. Please, in future, our leaders, we must consider and remember where you're coming from. Yeah, Mr. Boyce touched a very important point, specific when it comes to road network in the wrong region, specific from Swakop to Karibet, Omaruru to Ochiwarongo. That road is not safe in terms of volume of truck, when in terms of transportation, it's not safe. It needs to be upgraded in order to be smooth for everybody. That's my, my input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We certainly take note of your concern, and I believe that the organizers, as we go forward, will uh, look at that aspect, very important aspect as well. Okay, then, then, then we are here. No, thank you, um, Director of Ceremony, for the opportunity. Uh, Honorable Minister, all protocol observed. Uh, my name is Heinrich Afeni, Councillor of Swakopmund, and also a passionate African. Um, the Continental Free Trade Agreement area is something new to our communities, to Namibia. Number one, I applaud our government for fast-tracking the signatory to, uh, us to become a member of the 54 African countries that have already signed uh, this agreement. Obviously, the rectification is something that, is, uh, that is, can be done, but at least we have 54 countries now. Only Eritrea 
um, that has not signed yet. The awareness, I think that's down to government. We need to go to the education system. Since uh, 2021, the AFTA came into process now, in meaning that Africa is open for business. I want to just uh, share to say that let us, as soon as possible, introduce this new opportunity into our education system. Because we need now to create, uh, because people don't know about it, they, are, they can hear about it here and there from us who are trying to do something. Uh, but I just want to say that let us uh, get our 121 constituencies and make it into a, a what you call the language, uh, layman language, because it's a very broad, uh, broad um, development which complements the AU Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, where Africans are in charge of directing Africa and make it a prosperous Africa. Um, the port, since uh, Dr. Theopin Gurirab, I believe that he is very happy right now, but I truly do believe that he would be very happy knowing that the Namibia he fought for, that all the energy they put in economic prosperity in our lifetime will be achieved. Since the theme is on uh, Erongo region and how Erongo region can benefit from the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement area, Namport plays a critical role because I think this is the, you know, since Karas is also trying to take uh, <laughs> Erongo to task, but I do believe that uh, the biggest port in the country is in Erongo region, in Walfish Bay. Our awareness is on, I think uh, the CEO has mentioned that uh, it is cheaper for us to get, to move cargo from here to Asia and to other uh, countries besides Africa. I think it's now maybe government, uh, like we are doing with Botswana, unfortunately Botswana is a landlocked country, to look at the countries like Ivory Coast, Cameroon, Nigeria, how we can be able to now look at to see how we can bring cargo I think this is now, because what we want to see is that in the next uh, series, uh, the 20th is to now, or the, Dr. Theo Ben Grirab is to see that the Namibian government now, their goods and products, and there's a Chicago ship that moved from Angola uh, to Lome, and then this is how much you guys can get products, and these are the type of products. I think those are the type of uh, um, in, uh, uh, good news we want to hear. And, but again, I just to acknowledge my standing up, I just know that this is, if Namibia, I know Namibian entrepreneurs are only know how to do business in Oshakati, in Swakopmund, in Okahanja, and uh, my brother, boy, Mr. Boyce is here. We've been talking about, you are doing great job connecting Namibia to the, to the other African countries. We want to know what are the opportunities. And I think this is a applaudable opportunities, I just stood up to say there is something happening. And this something happening, we must not sleep, Namibians, Erongo region. Our leaders are here, and let the, we just want, what are those opportunities? How can we prepare ourselves? But this is acknowledgement to say uh, we are ready to go and do business in Africa. We want to unpack these opportunities, hence obviously through the Africa Economic Leadership Council, we have started an initiative that is focusing on unpacking the continental free trade and the opportunities that continental free trade has uh, for our people and more training. But thank you very much. This is just an input, awareness and education and the port, how it's playing a critical role for the trade. And uh, obviously the trucks, how do, we, but how do our people move goods from point A to point B? And that's what our people want to know, and that's where the money is. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. We would now come over to this side. Honorable. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Roger. Um, it's actually Ishmael Roger Rehovandu Nautoro. <clears throat> I'm from the river town of Omaruru. Now, I, I think um, primarily one should really um, comment the efforts and the, um, uh, the endeavors of government really to, towards uh, the realization of 
um, bilateral you know, agreements and uh, the geopolitical um, endeavors towards the total elimination of the barriers to intra-African uh, trade progressively. Also, um, uh, towards the promotion of liberalization and so on. Now, what I, want, what I have noted is that hypothetically, and I think, well, it's a good thing, since the inception um, of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, birthed on the 21st of March 2020, 2018, and then inception on the 30th of May um, 2019, we heard about out of the 53, 55 African countries, states, 54 um, signatures, isn't it? And then um, thus far, only 43 countries have deposited um, their instruments of uh, uh, ratification. Now, my question is, how do we strike a balance in terms of the significance of um, tariff revenues, um, losses, and the uneven distribution of costs and benefits to all um, partners. My second question, before the last one, which is the third question. We have the issue of Gungula. Is it Gungula? It's Gungula, eh? What can we... I think this is, unfortunately, the Ministry of, of Mines. It's not here, but... I think that is, if you look at the, the issue of um, fuel and so on, it is the biggest challenge in our country, and I think across. So what is there? What can be done? What can we do? What prospective can we create for us to also benefit from that, uh, from, from the uh, fuel that is coming from Angola? Finally, um, I think we should, it, it is time for Africa to really think big. We applaud the government for the recent, uh, you know, the, the opened borders between the, the Trans-Kalahari border and so on. But I think we need to, in terms of the trade agreements, we need to think a little bit bigger, starting with the international renegotiation of the international trade agreements to really benefit the African continent um, in all, at, at length, in full length, maximum benefit. When you look at Namibia, we produce zinc, we produce diamonds, uranium, uh, copper, gold, and so on. Sorry, so on. can you just go to the question? Yeah. Please. There, and uh, <laughs> when you also compare to all the other countries that, that are producing the same, but in terms of Microeconomics, we are only in the primary sector of production. Honorable and I think, Notoro, and I this think is the question. The question is, <laughs> the question is, is it, is it not time for Africa to really look in terms of the renegotiation of these international trade agreements so that we do not only benefit from the primary sector of production? so that we can migrate to secondary and further and further. Thank you. Honorable. Can we stick to the questions, please? The speeches has been done. Let's go into the questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Um, I think my question is very simple, and I'll bring it in layman's term. Uh, my name is Ryan Gordon. I'm from Wolfis Bay, and I just have a simple question. With all this good news that we just heard now, um, it's, 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 it's something new for us, as the uh, Honorable said. And my question is this, see that there's opportunity in a door that has been opened for Irongo eventually. What will our youth benefit from this? Why I'm asking this question is, as soon as opportunity arises in a certain place, the youth and people are coming all over to grab this opportunity. And the youth of Irongo 
are being left out again. Working with the police and the drug squad and the reserve force, we have this problem in, in the Irongo region that drug is a big problem. Our youth, our ladies, the young kids, 14 years, selling their, their bodies just to earn money, selling drugs just to earn money. And I think with this, this door being open, we have to look, or you as leaders, or we as leaders, have to look at how we can accommodate the youth of Irongo to benefit from this door that's been opened. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Then, yeah, then we go, shall we re respond or shall we just take more and then finish off? Um, thank you for the opportunity, Conway Director of Ceremony. Um, I have a few questions, right? But I would also like to start to say, my name is Sierra Lee Ilago. I'm a Pan-Africanist and I'm a governance and IRD agent. Uh, thank you very much. So I would like to share in the sentiments of Dr. Seidler. He has really, really submitted a mouthful, you know, submission. And I hope that not only are our leaders listening, but I also hope that we as community members and the local leaders, the local authority councillors, the constituency councillors, office of the governor have taken great notice on how we can improve our region of excellence. Thank you. So the first question is, looking at Africa's history, with developing frameworks and abandoning them along the way. The Abuja Treaty, Agenda 2063, and now we are with AFTA, yeah? What mechanisms does Namibia have in place to ensure a successful and beneficial inter-trading amongst Africa, or at least within SADC? That's the first question. The second question is, what is prohibiting you know, I'm basing this, this question on the submission of Dr. Steitler like, again. Yeah? Uh, what is prohibiting SADC towards or going towards or moving towards a common currency, one currency in SADC? What's prohibiting us? The third question is, I know we're talking about intra-trading or intra-trading in Africa, but what mechanisms has our government put in place to promote domestic trading within Namibia first. What are our products as Namibians that can benefit the north, the south, the east, and the west that we haven't traded amongst each other? One of the things that I want to bring up as an example is fish. Fish is expensive. It's a Namibian product. It's harvested, harvested here, but it's expensive. How can northern Namibia, eastern Namibia, and southern Namibia, and even within western Namibia, you know, benefit from that. The fourth question is, and I would like to also cement what the previous speaker just asked, the youth industry. We are hearing about so many different industries that are being created in Namibia. But what about a youth industry? Because what role are youth expected to play? Are we only voting mechanisms or not? How can we add value? How can our governments not elbow us, but how can they make us equal partners so that we can, you know, collectively grow the Namibian economy? The fifth question, I'm sorry, but I have to ask these questions. What M&E mechanisms are in place in terms of green hydro energy that can ensure that locals benefit? Namibia has been greatly blessed with so many natural resources, but our locals and our people on the ground aren't really benefiting. And of course, we applaud our government. I mean, if people that are, are troubled in Africa will tell you that Namibia is paradise, but how can we make it better paradise for our locals? And my sixth is more of a congratulatory statement. Uh, we have in our midst... And I, I, I say this not because I want to, you know, be funny, but I think some of these things should be, you know, put on a dress. Uh, next to me here, we've got Dr. Martha Umati. First of all, we want to congratulate her on her international award. We appreciate her work. She's one of the people that have stood with young people in... Can we please give a round of applause? Dr. Mata, we want to see you, yes, please. Yes, please, doctor. This, this lady has stood doctor, with... Doctor, 
Dr. Umati, please stand up. I know I'm putting her on the spot, but sometimes it's important to acknowledge people while they are still alive, while they can hear this. Doctor. Things. Doctor, please stand up. Uh, no, no, no. Let's give a round of applause, please. Uh, Dr. Umati has stood with young people, in, not only in this region, but in this country. Uh, we, as the Pan-African Renaissance, we have greatly, greatly benefited from Dr. Umati. She has promoted, she has, you know, really, really empowered young people. And as a Rongo region, um, the mining sector goes unencountered in this region. We are not genuinely aware of the contributions that the mining sector in terms of the, the CSI. What is the mining sector actually contributing to a Rongo region? Uh, what are their development and skill strategies in terms of empowering locals? Because they're coming here and they are mining our resources. We know the economics at play, them putting in whatever billions they're putting in to start up a mine, but they should follow suit the examples of the likes of Dr. Martha Umati that is genuinely Thank you. giving back. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the last two before uh, Dr. Katsavivi rounds off the question session. Thank you, um, Director of Ceremonies. Um, without a will, I would actually like to... Um, Post a question to the Irangore. And um, a few, um, it's actually a few questions or two. Point number one, straight to the point. Um, uh, what, what do you, what, what, what are you going to, do, or what are you doing in connection with SMEs that start off with businesses and they, at the later stage, they cannot pay their bills or um, they cannot afford or they just need a helping hand from especially the Rongo re, um, Red or the electricity uh, to pull them through certain periods of where they are going through certain things. Um, is there something in place, like uh, I can say example, say Namport, they do social investment. It's a social thing. They also do other things. But from the Rongo Red, what are you doing in connection with these things? And the reason why I'm posting this question um, to the Rongo Red is many businesses have failed because a lack of information uh, um, from the Rongo Red. Me personally, I've learned a lot uh, through certain consultants where I made effort to go to them, got information how systems work. Um, and also when you don't have money, what to do with a three-month payment and all these things. So is there anything in place for, from the Irongo Red to have these SMEs in terms of when they go through a certain period of maybe not paying instead of just putting off electricity? Is there something in place for that? And um, just a straightforward question to you. Thank you. Can we limit the questions, please? And uh, please note that we are having a live broadcast and our time is very limited, so we need to scale down. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Brian Tudembeo, and I'm also a Pan-Africanist. I um, appreciate the panel informing us and teaching us a lot of things that I did know. My question is simple, out of respect for your time. I just want to know, Dr. Stanker, is there anything or a platform where a layman like me can go and maybe be linked to the potential of countries, um, different entities in different countries selling certain products under the Free African Trade Agreement where you can easily partner up with other businesses like yours for trade purposes? Is there a database in place? And is there interim or segmented solutions? Um, that will enable the trade agreement to actually function. Because as good as it sounds, it's very difficult to make it work between so many countries. That's the first question. The second question is for the Minister uh, Honorable. What can government put in place 
to support our suffering masses in terms of uh, subsidized food system. Um, for instance, in Venezuela, we had a place uh, or condition where the government subsidized mice and oil, certain foods to make it affordable for the suffering masses. A lot of our people are currently suffering, not having enough food. Surely some of the taxes can be diverted. Is there a possibility that government can look at subsidizing, even if it's just millimil and something else, so that the farmers can produce at a lower cost and our people can, with a $20, at least feed themselves for a day? Thank you. All right, thanks, Paul. Quickly, quickly, Paul, relevant questions to this topic. Please, quickly. Thank you, uh, Director of Ceremony. I speak on the portal of Zev. My name is Paul Tangini Jambula. Um, I have a few points here, but most of them are not it's more a contribution or comments than questions. First of all, I'd like to applaud the government for really working hard to be part of this program and to be one of the first countries to sign this Africa Treaty Agreement. I think a lot of people don't understand the importantness and also the impact it will have once we are full in swing. Um, so on that one, I would just like to point that it's now maybe for us as a country to organize ourselves properly to know which sectors we want to maximize to benefit from from our local economy to benefit now through this trade agreement and which sectors to, to protect. Um, now, we've been speaking about this for the last two years and so on, on this Africa Free Trade Agreement. But I think what will be important is that maybe national government, now we have 14 regions, for example, in the Arongo region, to have somebody who's more your focal point in the region here who understand who's communicating with central government, maybe the regional council here, to be able to facilitate and engage information. Because now, we're talking about this trade agreement. Most people don't know where we are now and where we'll be going after this is in force. Just that simple example, I think it will make a lot of sense. Now, some of us from the uh, public here, sitting and listening to councillors or even honorables asking questions, I think it's important that when you have such things like even the Green Heart Region or even this agreement, someone at the Regional Council sitting here who is able to discriminate it for the information to be facilitated locally on the ground here. We don't want to have councillors and people who have voted in positions to be asking you as the national officers about these things. In fact, actually, they should be te teaching us. So decentralization of information and roles not necessarily to take up the role, but someone maybe the National Planning Commission dealing with the people in the region. And they help to go to the local authorities and share some of this information. So now where we are and where we're going with this trade agreement will really help. And f once we understand, then we can maximize our ben to organize ourselves to benefit from this. Um, one of the issues I wanted to men mention is that the, when it comes to now the green hydrogen and opportunities like this, is someone also mentioned that um, what, where do we benefit? Um, I think at central government, we also need to look at the vetting of Namibian companies. A good example I would say is that, for example, we have three projects here, the green hydrogen. One of them is going to be here in Sokopmund. Just said when you enter Sokopmund, it's a private company. So now, if we're saying we want Namibian, Namibian companies to benefit for 40%, we need to do proper vetting that it's not a foreign person set up a company here because the company is local and they get the tender and then you are saying you are investing money in the local economy. Because this is what's also happening with tenders where companies are winning. Yes, they are lo locally registered, but how much is the percentage? So we need to look at into that line that to make sure that it really that the locals and the Namibians benefit from that. But in all of that, um, because of, of time, this lastly is the issue of the trade uh, movement of goods. We see here, and the potential is that in the next five years, cargoes will increase. We need to, push, uh, to, to promote the mixed econo economy that we fix the rail from Vavish Bay to Karibeb. When you're coming from Winduk 
or up north, the first point is Karibeb. If you push, that Karibeb becomes a kind of a mini dry port. And then the rail is properly working from Vavish Bay to Karibeb. Dry goods products can just pick up there. They don't have to come all the way. And you reduce that narrowed road of, from Karibeb, especially Usakos, to coming down to the coast. Kind of mixed economy. And it will cost government very little bit because you are only spending about 200 kilometers to fix that rail while we're doing the other national parts. Because those are all things to say if we, we put mixed economy, then we can fix our issues. But in, in all that, thank you very much for being here and to share this knowledge with us and, and that we can find solutions for our problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Peter. Honor. Thank you very much. Uh, I was not intending to say anything other than to compliment our panelists for their excellent, precise presentations. I think those of us who came here wanted to learn a bit more, benefited from the uh, brief summaries that were nicely presented. I also wanted to compliment the Ministry of international relations and cooperation for, for having actually facilitated this particular lecture. It's been taken from the national capital to the region, particularly near Rongo. I think it was ex extremely beneficial to the region and to the people who reside in, our, in, in this part of our country. I think we need to compliment the ministry for that. And lastly, as a a historian had particular vested interest in wanting to encourage that this particular lecture series um, properly summarized and documented and made available in some sort of form so that we will pick it up in our various libraries across our great country. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Peter Katsavivi, for that input. I think uh, most of the questions are the same, so we will just allow one or two uh, uh, panelists to respond to the questions. Shall we start with the Deputy Minister? Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe before Dr. comes in, uh, on behalf of the ministry, allow me really to tender the apology that this whole proceedings is not being translated. We were, like myself sitting here, I was not made aware that there are people who may need translations. And uh, on behalf of the organizing team also, I think it's something that we really, that really not to be repeated. Maybe they did not know of uh, the audience. One who really don't know, but I think in future is to study who our audience is to provide the needed services. So to go to the, or, or to the topic in question, the African continental free trade area, I just want to highlight a few points because there have been questions that were coming up again and again of the mechanism in place or that the government has put in place. I think in my opening statement, I have indicated that this is a newly established instrument across the continent. And uh, with that, or from various who, uh, speakers, managed to also say that it's only one country so far that did not uh, 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 register or, or, or ratify this instrument. So now, many questions that are coming are questions that are not really relating to the African uh, uh, continental trade area. And then one challenge or one of the barriers is we are saying that this is not a country specific or not only that matters for Namibia or it's not a Namibian thing alone to deal with. This is across the continent and we all well aware what our continent 
is going through. If we have to talk about the political stability across the African co continent, will be regarded also as one of the barriers which may hinder the successful operationalization of this uh, African continental free trade area. When we are talking of the mechanism, upon its establishment, each and every African member state has been requested to come up with your own national plan. I have mentioned this during the opening statement, that it's expected that from each and every country, you are requested to come up with, to develop your own national plan, aligning it with the broader objectives and principles of the African continental free trade areas. When we're talking about these objectives, we were talking of the barriers. What hinders the process to go smooth? What can we do for this process to succeed? Of which we were saying that is zero tariffs, kind of those things have been mentioned here. What can we do for this trade? Or what do we mean by free trade area? Those have been mentioned by various uh, uh, panel members here. What we have to take into account is that when we are talking of the African continental free trade area, we are talking about selling products from one country to another, taking in, into consideration that the mentioned barriers which hinders now this process of country trading between countries are removed. This is what we are trying to, or each and every country that is trying to address, is to remove this barrier for this process to go smooth. Again, uh, one of the barriers that uh, uh, the continent has to look at is that of silencing the guns across the African continent. How do you trade while you are fighting? How will the program go uh, uh, smooth? It, I, I may transport my stuff from here to country A to C, but when I'm coming to country D, where the country is really at war, how will I proceed to country E, which is not in conflict of any war, or where the guns are silenced? How will I pass country D, which the guns are still can be had ac uh, uh, across that country. So when we are talking about this issue, we are really not talking of uh, Namibia alone, because Namibia alone will not be able to succeed when we are talking about the African uh, uh, continental free trade area. We are talking of trading between countries. Thank you very much. Doctor. Thank you. Uh, the, I must say that there were so many questions and they are very profound. And some of the questions we can have a, a separate lecture on each of them. Uh, but many of them cut across broad mm. economic issues. And as I was formulating my response, I wanted to, to anchor it with two observations. The first one is, how do you eat an elephant? piece by piece. And the second one is, it's an observation I wanted to make, I say charity starts at home. So, so often we want not to eat the elephant piece by piece, we want to start by eating the whole elephant. And then things become so complex. So how can we simplify it? Um, if, we, if we want to promote trade, for example, uh, we have had made very good experience with Botswana. So that's piece by piece. I think the Namibia-Botswana relationship, the past five years in particular, has deepened to the extent that I can travel with my ID to Botswana. And we see the Botswanas are coming to, the Botswanas are coming to Namibia for, for holiday. They like the coast. So it's working. We have now the, the 24 hour stop, so it's working. So why can't we replicate that model also with Zambia? Yeah, we just start with Zambia. Forget 
the DRC and further up. And then what prevents us from doing the same with Angola? Our Namibian companies are already going to Angola. I can give you big names. They are saying they like to do business in Angola. Angola has recovered. We have a history of trading with Angola. The Kuka shop comes from Angola, from the Kuka beer. <laughs> so we have a deep history with Angola. So why can't we, why can't we engage but in the same way and we formalize it a bit? And if we work with Angola, we can actually tackle the red line issue uh, much, much quicker. And Zimbabwe is also here. And Zimbabwe already has a dry port. And they say, okay, let's focus on those three countries for a while. And we see how can we stimulate trade, just, just for them. At, at the same time, we can still, we can still uh, look at the broader issues, the top continental issues and, the, and also the global issues. But look, the Eurogawa round of trade has been negotiated forever and ever, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna be concluded anytime soon. But we can do something with our trade with Angola, with, with Zambia, with, with Botswana. In fact, trade between Namibia and Botswana has picked up significantly, partly because the, of the diamond arrangement with Botswana. And, and so we, we have models that we can work on. Now we say charity starts at home, so what is there that we can do? Uh, and I just want to make one correction. Like, I, I didn't want to come across uh, is, is, is promoting regionalism, because I think that we should also guard against promoting regionalism. This is a Namibian issue, mm. you see, and regions must hold hands together. Mm. And, and there, uh, somebody had a very, very profound question on how to promote domestic trade then? How do regions work together in a more formal way? Because the question was more specific, are they, what barriers are there? There's really no legal barrier. Because when Namibia became free, people and goods can move freely with the exception of meat. Yes, and we must, we must also have that meat. And to some extent, we can also get the meat if it's quarantined. And so there's a, a, bit of, a bit of movement, but we have to, <laughs> uh, we have to, allow, we have to allow meat to come me from certain regions to come also to the Irongo region, just as fish will go to, to that region. So, so, so I think there are some things we can do, we can do about it. But uh, why that question is so profound for me, if you, look at, if you look at the United States of America, they can account for GDP by, by, by state. And United States of America, it's the most, in, if you use trade, figures, like uh, one of the, the ways to measure whether you're an open economy is you look at the ratio of your international trade to GDP. And so the most open economy is Hong Kong and then Singapore. And, and the US, by international standards, is the closest economy. But you know what they have in the US that's different? Their domestic trade is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So there must be scope to promote domestic trade, and that can give learning experiences. The, 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 there are two more questions that I want to speak on, one that, that's very close to my heart. The one is, will free trade kill the SME sector? It's, it's not certain, but I can tell you it's a massive risk. It's a massive risk. And, and even, even if it's not uh, Africa trade, but re remember when Walmart came, okay. it posed a huge risk for, for small traders. And there the government actually intervened and there was a court case. And I think that was good that government intervened. But, but I think just in general, there are mechanisms that we have now put in place to promote SMEs. But at this point in time, we should also ask how effective are they and can they be improved? Uh, we had a case where a credit guarantee scheme that was actually targeted at the SME sector, but it didn't work. We had the SME bank, 
but it didn't work. And, and, and we have a SME strategy, but it's time to take stock and to see why is it that it doesn't work. Um, one thing that uh, one gentleman asked also the question, I think he has left on the, on the uneven distribution of, 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 of taxes and so on. Uh, it's, of course, the fiscus has two sides, the taxes and then the, the allocation. So as you, we must also question allocation. How do we allocate? It's not just about collecting the money, but how do we allocate? Because if you look at, at the budget, we allocate fairly okay. The, the biggest chunk of the budget actually goes to social sectors. But now the deeper question is, do we see the impact? Are there losses? Are there leakages? Can we spend so much on some sectors, but uh, we don't see then the impact? So we have to pause and take stock and see why is it that the impact is not where it should be. On, on, the, SM, on, the, on the Texas side, I've, I've elaborated a lot on it, but there's one thing that's, as I said, it's close to my head, it's like, like the SMEs. Where we can make it easier for the SMEs, and I know that the government is aware of one of them, is, is, on, the, is on, the, on the value added tax refund. That, that one must be, SME should be prioritized on that refund. Because companies go bankrupt not because they, they're not profitable, but they go bankrupt because of, of cash flow. Uh, so there I know that the government is aware of it and they are trying to catch up. I must say I've, I've heard in some instances good feedback, that, uh, but it's still, it's still something that should be addressed better. The other one on the SME development, SMEs is to get tax cash flow back into the SMEs, we should have a differential tax system for the SMEs. So SMEs should not be, the tax burden should not be the same as for, for well-established companies. <laughs> so so let's, let's, let's allow the SME to be well-established before we tax the SME, instead of taxing the SME and then the SME dies. The other one was on, on the youth. So this is, this is very critical and that we, we, have to, we have to get the youth involved. Uh, and one, one of the, the key mechanisms that I see in other countries that are, are working is, is this, um, what you call it, attachments, job attachments, where the, where you attach young people that have graduated either from a BTC or from UNAM or wherever. I know in the budget there is a, there's a target for this year to, to at least get some attachments of graduates, I think up to 1,000, but we should do more and longer and, and also uh, thereafter have a plan for them to graduate after they've been it's not attachments, it's internships. Yeah, that's the word that I was looking for. So, so, so there, are, there are some ways that we can get the youth in. Mind you, the youth is, are very creative. So one, one of the biggest growing industries in Africa is actually the creative industry. If you go to, 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 to Nigeria, Nollywood is big. These guys make big, big money. It's an industry that's growing very rapidly. And so the youth has this talent and this creativity that we should allow them to be channeled into, into becoming entrepreneurs and into, into actually and support them to go out. You know, sometimes you have a youth choir that can't even afford to go and showcase their, <laughs> uh, their creativity. So, so there is, when I say cherries should start at home, is where one should come together and brainstorm, together with, 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 with the creative industries, also the sports industry. The sports industry is critical, especially post-COVID. Post-COVID is very critical that people are starting to suffer from mental health issues. Sport is a great outlet. Uh, sport can play a key role also in prevention of gender-based violence. Sport is an industry in its own. It can make money. I just read a story of uh, uh, one player, Mane is his name, and he has 
is making like 220,000 pounds a week. And he, he takes it to his country and he's built schools, he's built hospitals, he's built houses. So can you see how the sports industry can actually also contribute to our economy? Um, the final one, there was a question specifically to me, which is on just that contact. I, the, I think there are avenues. I, I can give you one name if you contact Maria Emanuel, ML. She's also but in music. She will, she will connect you with some of the networks that she has. But there are, there are some networks where you can, where you can contact. The other, other thing is also a key benefit for the Erongo region that I forgot is the, the cable has landed here. The cable didn't land in Pinduk. So you guys must now have high-speed internet here. So people can do courses online. My son is 14 years old. He enrolled through Cosera Open University during the holiday, and he did a course in microeconomics at the University of Yale. So, so but there we need fast and affordable internet, not only fast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the bulk of the questions was answered. We have three minutes left. Three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, we'll start with him, and then we'll finish at home. Yes, thank you, Director of Proceedings. I'll be very brief. I think it is just prudent and befitting for me to also offer some level of response on the concerns raised uh, about the narrow and unsafe road between Swakopmund, Kariwap, and Oshiwarango. Uh, I'm pleased to inform uh, the audience that the uh, Roads Authority, the custodian for our road network, uh, has recently concluded a process, the adjudication process, for the upgrade of the, uh, of the Usakos Kariburp Road to a design layout that is often referred to as 2 plus 1. Uh, that is the same design for the Kariburp Okahanja Road. So that road will be upgraded to the same standard as the Okahanja Karibab Road. So that is essentially what we mean with road upgrade, which is basically uh, some sectional passing lanes uh, that you have on both sides of the road, as well as a broader paved uh, road shoulder. So that's one. Uh, the design, detailed design for Swakopmund, Usakos has been completed. Uh, feasibility studies have been completed. And there are now efforts to raise the necessary funding over the next two, three years to complete uh, that section also to a two plus one design uh, layout. So that will obviously support your mining industry and many other industries who are primary users of, uh, of that road. Uh, the same applies for uh, Kariwap Oshivarango, where some light rehabilitation has started, but there are also plans to upgrade that section of the road to a two plus one, which is actually outlined in the Logistics Hub master plan. And finally, uh, the, vol the railway site, the Wolfers Bay Kranzberg, as I've mentioned earlier, has been completed. Uh, detailed designs are currently ongoing, supported by the African Development Bank for the Kranzberg Tsumep uh, section of our railway network. And once the uh, study has been done, and obviously it proves feasible, Government will then work with the African Development Bank to also upgrade uh, that line. So I'll stop there for now. Thank, thank, you, thank you. you. Mr. Tino Anabe. Anabe. Yeah, on the question regarding Erongo Red, that's the only company in Erongo region that is owned by every person that is sitting in this room. So uh, therefore, feel free at any given time to approach us. If you have problems as SMEs and you are badly your problem is our problem, and therefore we would like to hear from you. Obviously, different people have different challenges, but they are horses for courses, so we will take you to the course where you can win. Secondly, uh, and finally, uh, the issue is the how. I think we are all sitting here. Sometimes we only come together for trade shows and exhibitions, but I think maybe it's time that not only here, but through your office and the leadership of the various towns and the councils, we, as the representatives of these institutions, myself, Mr. Kanime, and others, 
that are also not here, Biba. We can all come here to be able to have two or three days summit, you know, just to explain what we do and also to talk about the how, because we know the what. The thing is, we need to talk about how you can benefit from this after and many other things. So with this, so I submit and thank you. Thank you. In conclusion, I just want to touch quickly, just to add where Dr. Staitler has ended with the question of whether this uh, free trade agreement has been introduced to come and kill the, the small, medium enterprises. So my question will really be a no, just like as he has said, and uh, in my opening statement, it's a problem that it was in English, if it was a Gerero, I could have uh, clarified myself more better. I said, this uh, uh, free trade agreement will offer the SMEs an opportunity to broaden their horizons. Mm -hmm. If you look at this curve with the Namibian uh, uh, regalia that I'm having here, I did not come with it from Vinduk. I got this from an SME in Swakop Mount here. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I was in Enana. I did not come with it from there. I, got, I came from the expo where I also bought some few Namibian products. When we are talking of uh, that Namibian products will hit the market easily through this uh, free trade agreement, we are talking of these products will not just come from nowhere to come and land maybe in Vinduk and be transported from there. This will start from the grassroots. And these grassroots we are talking about will now be the SMEs. I just wanted to add that one for the sake of uh, clarifying that one of uh, whether this has been introduced to come and kill the SMEs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we get another applause for our panelists and their inputs, please? And of course, you have the questions you have raised. I now have the honor and pleasure to call upon Mr. Erastus Hailwa, the Deputy Chairperson of the Dr. Theo Van Kurira Lecture Series Committee from the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation to give the vote of thanks. Mr. Hailwa. Good afternoon once again. I was here earlier, so it's been a good three hours of engagement. I have the task, the easiest task of the day, really just to thank um, our participants. Uh, so let me start by thanking our Honorable Deputy Minister for making time in a busy schedule to come and address us and be with us. So truly appreciate it. Furthermore, we had great panelists, great discussions, lively uh, information and really this is a platform that we have in, in mind. So when we engage, when we created the Theo Ben Gurriel Lecture Series, is to engage the public and have such discussions and really build uh, on, on uh, our knowledge. Uh, furthermore, uh, let me express our gratitude to the Governor's Office, uh, the Governor as, and his office for really uh, assisting the committee in ensuring that um, this event takes place so his office is um, really, really appreciated, assisted us in uh, ensuring that this is a success. Um, I will continue to thank our partner throughout this series, um, the NBC. The NBC has been with us through the 19th uh, series. They've really been uh, ensuring that uh, this platform reaches not only the specific region we are addressing, but it reaches across the country on social media, so even those that are not in the country can still follow these engagements and build from that. I will then be amiss of me if I do not thank the committee members and the volunteers that have been uh, working for the past two weeks to ensure that uh, this is a success. So really, I appreciate my colleagues in the ministry uh, and so forth and the volunteers who have been putting in efforts to ensure that uh, we are having such an engagement. Um, Finally, but not least, let me thank you, the audience, uh, for really making time. Uh, it takes a lot of commitment to be with us 
for three hours just to listen and to engage. Uh, so really appreciate uh, you coming, especially the youth, that you are here to, to engage and listen and see how best such a platform can benefit you. So again, this is a continuing, continuous process. It's not a once-off process. As um, alluded to earlier, we have uh, reports. So each, each, each of the series has a report. We prepare reports. So after three or four weeks, you're then able to reach out to our ministry and say, can I please get a short report and see how best you can take it from there. So it's, it's an engagement. It's not, it's not a once-off uh, platform. Uh, finally, in abstention, um, I would like to thank our speaker uh, who just left us. I really, it's, it's really appreciating that uh, a senior person in our government does makes time to attend this, as well as our councillors from uh, all uh, municipalities of, of the Ronga region, um, political parties that are present here today. Really, it's, uh, it's, in, it's, it's really encouraging that um, we have such engagement from all corners of life in such an important um, agenda. Finally, but not least, let me again appreciate the panelists that um, we had a good discussion. And some of the, some of the questions that are asked is just to say that the Dr. Theoben Gurab Lecture Series is, um, is part of the Deputy Prime Minister's performance agreements. So that's, that's how important this lecture series is, that the Deputy Prime Minister has to report to the President on such engagements. So what we discuss here does get a chance to reach uh, high offices, and that's why it's important to really engage and understand issues going forward. And um, with that said, I think uh, I'll hand over to the, to, the, to the speaker just to guide us going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hairwa, for the vote of thanks. And I want to thank myself <laughs> also. <laughs> you have been a good crowd, and I really appreciate your participation. We have now come to the end of this program, the 19th uh, edition of the Theoban Kurirab Lecture, here in the Erongo region. And I want to thank all the panelists, the viewers from across Namibia and all over the world, and all participants during this session. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have truly made this discussion really fruitful. And I must also acknowledge that uh, one of the omissions was our chairperson of the Erongo Regional Council, and our regional councillors also present here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have now to sing the anthems. Thereafter, I'll invite you for, for a few snacks. Thank you. <laughs>